Okay, um, now that we are, uh, we've reached 10 o'clock, we should start. My name is Dasom Lee. I'll be moderating today's session. I'm an assistant professor at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. And um, uh, we have wonderful speakers today here with us online and in person. Um, before we officially start, I would like to do a quick introduction about the eCourse Coalition. Um, the Equals Coalition is a global partnership of organizations that aim to promote gender balance in the technology sector by championing equality of access, skills, and leadership for women and men alike. The Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, KAIST, is um, one of the leading research coalitions along with Georgia Tech in the US. And we are currently looking for the authors who wish to contribute their writing. So if you're interested, please talk to our organizers and the and the leader of the Equals Coalition here with us today. Our first speaker is with us on Zoom today. Uh, Professor Michael Best is the Executive um, Director of the Institute for People and Technology and Professor with the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs and the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Institute of Technology. He has been one of the leading figures in computing and global development, and we are very happy that he's, with here, he, he's here with us today um, on Zoom. So can you hear us, Professor Best? I can. I, Wonderful. Am I coming in okay? Um, you Do should you be momentarily. Just give us one second. Do you hear me now? Yes, we can see you and then we can hear you. Perfect. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Professor Lee. And um, good uh, morning to all you. Uh, good evening from the United States, where I um, am currently at, at 9 p.m. and just finished my dinner. And I'm uh, a little saddened that I'm not joining you in person. I certainly wanted to come to uh, Japan for IGF, but uh, unfortunately it didn't work for me. I was asked to just talk for five minutes, so this is gonna be very uh, fast, and I'm just gonna give some reflections on my sense of the inaugural Equals Taking Stock Research Report. As Professor Lee mentioned, um, Equals is a global partnership for uh, gender technology in a digital age. And their research coalition is currently ran by KAIST and Georgia Tech. But the research coalition, which is a unit or a division within the Equals Coalition Partnership, is an older organization as, uh, that was founded around 2015, 2016. Um, I founded it uh, working with colleagues from the ITU, GSMA, uh, UN Women and other um, partner uh, organizations. When I was the founding director of the United Nations University Institute on Computing and Society. So at the time I had left Georgia Tech, I was on a leave of absence and I was with the United Nations. Um, and I was in long conversations with in particular people like Secretary uh, General Doreen Bogdan uh, of the ITU about ways in which we as a global community can think about the gender digital divide. And by that, I mostly mean the uh, lack of uh, leadership skills and access for women and girls to the internet and other digital um, systems. Though more broadly, I'm thinking about that in terms of broader concepts of gender and lack of access. So um, in 2017, I had the good fortune uh, while I was still with the United Nations to um, bring on board as the leader of our gender technology lab at the UNU Computing and Society Institute, a wonderful scholar named Dr. Ara Basse. She unfortunately is not able to meet us uh, or join us right now because she actually has a competing meeting she's having. Um, but she um, joined uh, me as my director for the Gender Technology Lab. And we started talking about what it would mean to be a research coalition within the Equals Partnership and what it would mean for us to create a, a sort of tent post research report that would synthesize the existing status of the gender digital divide and help to uh, drive the conversation going forward. 
And so I, you know, as I, I think as is my sort of my standard um, situation, had a completely unrealistic and um, somewhat uh, idiotic vision for this report. Uh, and I put to Araba something like, uh, what if we do like the human development report, but for digital gender issues? So we'll have a complete global overview of the gender digital divide. We'll create new indices. We'll do a country by country review. Um, and then we'll do some sort of synthesis and analysis. And uh, of course, my, my good friend Araba was like, are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. Um, why are you not able to live in reality? And she instead, um, as the leader and ultimately the editor of this inaugural report, articulated an achievable, ambitious, and I think um, at the time, but also in ref uh, reflection, quite thrilling vision of a, of a report that we could do in two years time that would begin to articulate a synthetic overview of gender digital divide issues, but would set the stage really for what should and hopefully still will be a ongoing research enterprise focused upon um, issues of women and girls, empowerment, leadership, and access to digital systems. And I should say, that this is this um, sort of inner uh, vision, but also research enterprise, data-driven enterprise, was at the very founding um, interests of the Equals Global Partnership, including, and I remember this very clearly going back more than 10 years, uh, including in the very kind of DNA articulated by Secretary General Bogdan. Um, of the ITU. She always, as did uh, her ITU colleagues, um, who some of which I think might have recorded uh, interventions in this meeting or might even be there with you in Japan, uh, made it very clear that driving by data, which to um, some degree means driving with research, is fundamental to our both consideration of a global gender digital divide, but our, also our ability to respond to it. So in 2019, we released the Taking Stock Report, and I hope other uh, interlocutors tonight will, or this morning will speak to this, and that many of you in, in the room or online have read this report. Um, but this report, edited by Ara Basse and also by Nancy Hafkin and some other editorial committee members, and uh, contributed to by 53 researchers across the globe, um, in other words, a truly global enterprise with many, many uh, contributions, um, really set the standard for what this kind of global synthetic report might look like. I should, uh, I want to take a second to pause and, and think about Nancy Hafkin. I'm, I'm not sure if she's uh, able to join us at IGF this year, but she really is the Dean of uh, uh, Gender and ICTs. She has publishes, published many of the seminal documents in this area. Um, the global prize for work in gender and digital divide issues is named the Hafkin Prize after Nancy Hafkin. She published uh, her first report, research report on gender issues and digital divide in 1976. So I just want to appreciate um, somebody of that caliber serving as co-editor for our inaugural equals research synthetic report, um, along with Arba Say, who I think if she was here would immediately say that she is, oh, I'm seeing a note. Am I to read this right now? Um, I'm afraid we are running out of time, so we do have to move on, Professor Best. Are, are there any um, last comments that you wish to make? Oh. Um, Okay, I thought I had five minutes and I've taken six or seven, is that right? Yes. 
No, I think I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your wonderful um, talk. Our second speaker is Tamara Dancheva, uh, who is the Senior um, International Relations Manager with the Digital Gender Inclusion Task Force for the GM GSMA. She's a member of the European Union delegation to the W20 Engagement Group of G20, and she has extensive experience in political party um, systems and democracy stemming from her previous roles as head of the Human Rights Program for the Liberal International. Tamara has prepared a pre-recorded video for us um, Yes, the next slide. Esteemed colleagues and delegates, it's a pleasure to be with uh, you here today, albeit virtually. My name is Tamara Dancheva, and I represent the GSMA, which is uh, the trade association representing the global mobile industry. I also happen to represent the Equals Global Partnership for Gender Equality in the Digital Age as co-chair of the Equals Skills Coalition. So with those two hats on, I'm very pleased to be able to share with you some insights uh, and key um, findings from a three-year project um, that GSMA had the privilege to co-lead um, as part of the Equals Global Partnership um, and as funded by the EU Horizon 2020 program. Uh, I think you'll find the key findings and team for this project very fitting uh, for the topic we are discussing today, uh, which is empowering women in tech. The uh, project is structured around a single impact area and that is to create smart, sustainable and inclusive innovation ecosystems by building capacity and expanding networks for women and girls in social innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, it is anchored in the gendered innovations process uh, and provides a key opportunity to fulfill EU member states declaration of commitment to women in the digital space. It has formulated a strategic and ambitious work program to bridge the so-called valley of debt for girls and women in social innovation and entrepreneurship. As you can see from the graph on your screen, the project actually aims to bridge this particular gap. And of course, it has four main objectives. The first one is to raise awareness um, of the uh, gender gap in innovation, both social innovation and of course, entrepreneurship. The second goal is to encourage sustainable collaboration among public and private sectors. The third is to involve young people uh, in the design of innovation ecosystems. And the fourth, of course, uh, is to contribute to uh, better um, uh, opportunities for women and girls in the field, not least when it comes to education and jobs. Uh, the project is a three year uh, project due to be ending in December uh, of this year. Um, and as such, um, as we are near completion, it will be important to share with all of you what uh, the findings uh, from this uh, three year uh, project delivered. Um, and before I do that, I also want to emphasize that the project is as much about research as it is about capacity building. And I'll speak to that in a second. The key policy recommendations that the project delivered looked into recommending a gender inclusive innovation standard. Uh, this was done based on data delivered from research and focus group discussions conducted in 22 countries that actually revealed various factors are needed for an innovation friendly environment. Uh, therefore, um, what uh, you see here on the slide represents the four key um, elements that need to be taken into consideration um, for gender inclusive innovation um, ecosystems. Uh, the data that has fed into this uh, scientific um, definition for a gender inclusive innovation standard, and as well as of course the um, components uh, of this definition that you see um, on the screen, have also all, all been unpacked with the gender inclusive lens. Uh, and therefore, um, of course, at the core of this uh, gender inclusive innovation standard uh, is transformative, gender transformative innovations that go beyond um, just looking into the product and products and services themselves. Uh, it's actually about ecosystem in which these products and services are allowed to develop in a way that is critical for uh, sustainable development um, and of course um, critical in order to ensure that women and girls are put at the core of the innovation. I won't have uh, time um, to go into detail uh, into each of these core components, but I'm happy to share the policy brief following my presentation. Uh, one particular um, attention I would like to, to draw here is, of course, um, the gender inclusive language um, that uh, uh, is one of the key recommendations. Um, and on the basis of that, uh, we have also published um, a vocabulary of sorts uh, that recommends actually uh, what steps needs to be undertaken uh, for gender inc inclusive language um, to be uh, implemented and also, of course, how uh, that is defined uh, because, of course, definitions in this context are uh, increasingly or uh, uh, crucially important. 
Uh, and of course, as you see in the last point, um, documenting and archiving the uh, innovation performance is also critical uh, because that allows uh, for an assessment to take place um, and ensure that uh, indeed the uh, performance um, and the um, ideation processes are truly uh, gender inclusive. This is again a very brief and perhaps not so brief overview of the um, Equals EU project. I encourage all of you to visit the website uh, where you can find um, the plethora of other project outcomes and deliverables, um, and of course, follow um, the project on social media. And if you type Equals EU in your Twitter or LinkedIn uh, page, you'll be able to like, locate uh, those social media handles. Thank you so much, um, and I hope that this was of interest to all of you. Um, thank you, Tamara, for the for the video and for the interesting um, uh, discussion. Our third speaker. I'm moving on quickly so that we m we have a little more time for the Q and A later. Um, our third speaker is Jintali Sa, who is a uh, strategy and policy coordinator at the ITU. She has worked for several UN organizations such as UNESCO and UNDP in the field of ICT and development related to policy and implementation issues at an international, regional, and national level. She's here with us in person. Um, so please welcome Shintali. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, on behalf of our uh, Secretary General, Ms. Doreen Bogdan Martin, uh, as you all know that uh, one of her main priorities is uh, gender digital inclusion in all the work that we are doing uh, in the area of uh, digital uh, policies. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the handbook on mainstreaming gender and digital policies. And uh, this handbook we've been working with uh, EIF and uh, equals, of course. And uh, what's the purpose of this handbook? Uh, why have we created this handbook? Um, so uh, we all know that uh, you know it's uh, very difficult for women all around the world to uh, have uh, equal access uh, to uh, participate in the benefits uh, brought from the digital uh, you know technology revolution you know like uh, uh, there are several opportunities uh, that we have from the digital revolution but how do women benefit uh, from it you know uh, in order to be gender um, uh, responsive, our digital policies, strategies, programs, and projects need to consider the main challenges that prevent women uh, to, you know, to fully reap the benefits uh, that these of, that these opportunities can uh, provide, the opportunities that the digital economy can provide for all the women. Now, uh, some of these uh, challenges, like I mentioned, relate to uh, access, you know, access to women's access to digital technologies, digital skills, digital finance, which is a very, very important topic. We've been hearing about it uh, since day zero in IGF. Uh, entrepreneurship and leadership, infrastructure, and of course, digital services, which is really important. Access uh, for women to have digital services. Um, now, um, we did a, a, a little research and the handbooks that exist currently on gender mainstreaming, that they do not specifically uh, target policymakers involved in the formulation of uh, digital policies. Of course, there are a few exceptions, uh, but um, we thought uh, together uh, that this was a very important area that we need to uh, focus on. Now, um, how was uh, this handbook uh, developed? Um, so um, our country representatives, so ITU has uh, 193 uh, member states who are members of uh, our, our organization, um, identified uh, successful gender responsive policies, strategies, programs, and projects uh, that have been put in place by their respective governments. Uh, for example, in Africa, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Senegal, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, the Americas, uh, Argentina, Barbados, and so on, you can see on the slides, uh, Arab states, Asia and the Pacific, Commonwealth of Independent States, and Europe. So in total, we looked at uh, 19 countries, and we gathered a pool of 27 uh, such uh, good practices, as we may call them, uh, good uh, policy strategies and programs which were identified uh, by the countries. 
Now, uh, we did this, uh, we ha our headquarters are based in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, but we do have six ITU regional offices. So we work closely with the ITU regional offices and member states uh, to gather these uh, uh, strategies and policies. Uh, now, these uh, practices, like I said, good practices uh, that we found, uh, we gathered from the regional offices, they provide the basis uh, for this handbook. So what were our main uh, findings uh, when we went through these handbook, handbooks, uh, through these different practices? Um, so we realized that uh, there are good practices all over. You know, they are in developed countries, in developing countries, and in least developing countries. There are some wonderful examples from all over the world. They all take a different shape. Uh, of course, some are in the form of an activity, an activity could be a conversation with uh, young girls on how to become uh, scientists, how to study STEM, uh, for example, in Guatemala. It could be a project. Uh, there are several projects uh, in Zimbabwe in the uh, Mura uh, Murambinda uh, community networks. Um, programs, uh, they could take the shape of a program. Uh, j a good example was an e-safety women program in Australia. It could be a strategy. Um, again, in Australia and Palestine, we, we found some good intersectoral uh, gender strategies. Uh, an institution, uh, you know, basically uh, gender centers. Uh, there was a good example in Argentina. Uh, community networks, uh, Silicon Mountain community in Cameroon, and so on and so forth. Now, um, factors uh, behind a successful gender mainstreaming practices, there are multiple. Uh, we leave the slides behind so that, uh, uh, because my moderator just informed me I have only one minute left. <laughs> you can have a look, and the uh, handbook is actually available online as well. So what are the main uh, findings, uh, again? Um, government support practices by providing technology, for example, uh, providing uh, laptops, mobile phones, facilitating physical infrastructure, or by offering uh, free internet. You know. Secondly, uh, there are based. They are all these partnerships are based on uh, uh, you know very good collaboration between uh, governments, private sector, international organizations, and so on. Um, institutional setup uh, for putting these uh, gender responsive uh, policies in place, they do not differ from other digital policies. So it's not uh, something absolutely new, the framework and the foundation. Uh, it is close to how other digital policies uh, are made. The coordination mechanism around gender in digital policies, it serves to connect several ministries. So like I mentioned, we did discover that they are very intersectoral because gender is a cross-cutting topic and we do need it for everything. Gender inclusion is important for infrastructure, for security, for um, digital services, and so on and so forth. So it is intersectoral. Um, just concluding, so three recommendations uh, to mainstream gender in digital policies um, we discovered was to include a specific objective uh, to gender women or girls in national key strategic documents, the digital agendas, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, put in place projects or programs that specifically address women and girls. And thirdly, set a gender criteria for the assessment of project uh, proposals. So it's really important if there is a criteria which uh, kind of uh, forces you to make sure that uh, uh, gender inclusion is a priority in the project proposals. Um, so um, just the next steps and how ITU, and in particular its development sector, uh, can support members. In it. So we do several national assessments of existing digital policies um, and engagement and capacity development programs for uh, policymakers, which are uh, continuous in, through our ITU regional offices and uh, the headquarters also, of course. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Moderator. Uh, the uh, handbook is available online, like I mentioned. Uh, so please free to feel free to Google it and find it there. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, 
now we have our last speaker, Professor Moon Choi, who is an associate professor and the head of the Graduate School of Science and Technology Policy at KAIST. Her work focuses on social welfare technology policy and a, work, uh, and a research group focused on various, various digitally marginalized demographic groups such as the elderly, the women, and the refugees. She is also one of the leaders of the Equals Research Coalition, and if you have any questions um, about the Equals, I suggest you talk to her after the session. Please welcome Professor Choi. Okay, uh, thank you so much for the introduction and also thank you everyone for coming to this session, even if it's uh, early morning. And okay, so uh, uh, KAIST is uh, one of the co-leaders uh, with the, uh, a Georgia Tech and uh, I would like to discuss about what we are going to do for the next one year. Uh, okay, so as you, as you, uh, you, as uh, the uh, professor Mike Bass mentioned, that equals vision is about the you know sustainable development goal about uh, number five and uh, about the gender in uh, gender equality. And I feel we all know that uh, sustainable development goals cannot be achieved without gender equality, and uh, equals cover the various multi uh, dimensions of uh, the gender disparity inequality from the assess skills leadership. And so uh, we try to, to uh, ensure practitioners and policy makers have uh, intelligence uh, they need to make informed decision. Uh, in academia, we call evidence-based practice or evidence-based policies. And we found that collaboration and sharing information and collecting data together would be a very powerful you know, drive and also tool to achieve our goals. So as a research coalition, we meet once a year. It's called the annual meeting. And uh, this year, we had a day zero event on Sunday evening. And we had a very productive meeting and discuss about the next goal. And uh, next goal is about the writing an annual report. And uh, we had the, the first report uh, in uh, 2019, and then uh, next year will be the second one, but we tried hard to publish annually or biannually. And as the, um, Professor Mike Bass mentioned, that the first report has about 53 authors, and but this time we will have a, a smaller version because the first report covered the foundation knowledge. So now we are moving to the next step. So we have discussed uh, what uh, we are going to do for the you know, annual report, and then we decided to have uh, three themes uh, following the structure of equals, it's assess leadership skills. So we are going to announce a call for authors, and all of you in this room are invited, and uh, there are two options. One is writing a chapter that's uh, uh, between the 4,000 and 6,000 words, and then there's another one. Uh, bec we know that there are many non-academia practitioners and policymakers, and uh, you might want to share your good practice and you know good measurement to or good policy initiative. So you can contribute to your case study. For example, you know the ITU has uh, several initiatives, and we can include that between 1,000 and uh, 1,500 words. So. Uh, the deadline for the statement of interest, that's the title of the, your, the, the uh, manuscript and also your name and also uh, two, three sentences about what it is about. That would be the December 1st. And we aim to publish this annual report next year, mid-October. And then uh, we aim to have uh, our annual meeting on that time. So annual meeting will be to celebrate the publication of annual report, and also we will discuss uh, the, the next theme of the report of 2025 annual report. We probably uh, hosted that annual meeting in, in KAIST, South Korea, and then you know, all the authors will be invited, and we, we will do our best to provide the you know, accommodation and meals, so you know, uh, author uh, opportunities and also disseminate your, you know, the practice would be a good uh, way to, you know, work with our group. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Professor Choi. Uh, we, uh, we have 30 seconds left. Um, <laughs> actually, 20. So, um, do, do we, I think we can take one question and maybe we can focus on the, the, the Q&A after the session ends. Can we, does anyone have a question? 
Okay then, um, I guess we're finishing uh, two seconds early now. So um, uh, thank you so much, please. Um, I was wondering if um, you also in the part of leadership, does that relate to leadership of women's businesses or also to policy making? Because I have the feeling that there's a lot going on in terms of digital skills and education, but how to make policy making in itself more inclusive. That's a fantastic uh, question. Uh, I forgot to mention that. So we are going to recruit the authors, all the three sectors, government, nonprofit, and also uh, you know the business sector. So in the leadership, uh, the the theme we have uh, really diverse uh, the authors, you know, working in the private sector. So one of the important messages from this annual report is how to translate you know the the research findings into the practice. So. The, the, th the topic that you mentioned is perfectly fit to this annual report, so please, you know, submit your statement of interest, so we will, you know, consider that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the question, and uh, I'd like to sincerely thank all the speakers that came here today and the audience, um, and uh, so thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful time in Japan. Thank you so much for coming.